for watching another Nerd Stalker interview. <laughs>
push uh, the team that was involved. He gave an order, uh, and the order uh, was impossible to carry out. <laughs> Just totally impossible to carry. He couldn't do it. Uh, he turned to his command, his second in command, and said, "Well, you know, you just what happened?" And the guy says, shrugs his shoulder, shrugs his shoulders. He looks at the guy that was supposed to be carrying out the order, which was that, uh, you know, increasing the speed and that kind of stuff. And then he looks back at the second in command and says, "Well, sir, this ship does not do what you just asked for it to do. It's not designed that way." So all of a sudden, the guy realizes that because he's not knowledgeable about that particular ship, he's not making use of the fact that he doesn't know and that the military style organization, when he doesn't know what's supposed to be going on and says he's not you know, obtaining the feedback from his second in command, he had to completely rework how to be on that ship. And instead of going through the straight military form where you dictate orders, he had to go back and say, have people come back to him with recommendations. And then he would let them act on his recommendations because they're the ones that are supposed to know. And by doing that, he was able to adjust and make that ship become one of the best performing ships in the Navy when he, when he was assigned to it. It was the worst performing ship in the Navy. So he's actually, you know, th those kinds of things occur. There are other places. I read a book recently talking about how to get teams to work together. And when you get them together and start working, you'll find that some, some people are kind of nasty. <laughs> they may hear, hear an idea. And say, oh, that's stupid. Try to make other people feel bad, you know, by, uh, but that did, that makes those individuals feel less uh, bold at making those suggestions. And you don't know whether those suggestions can be tweaked a little bit to make them really workable. And by having people feel, uh, feel odd about making those comments or suggestions, you really, uh, you, you lose all the encouragement you should be giving them. And it's the ability to get a team together and have them uh, hash out issues and problems, uh, have them be able to work through to come up with the best solutions, um, and have everybody have an input into it. You get a team buy-in. When a team buys in, then they'll execute maybe a little bit more uniformly, as opposed to have one person doing something or another person doing something and have them work at odds with each other. And so it's kind of important mm -hmm. if you can get there to do that. Uh, once hired. Uh, a person to come in and head up a clinical development and organization. And I had a consultant and the consultant was, uh, was top notch. I mean, he was really excellent at what he does. And so was the guy we hired. So I hired one guy in and asked him to work with the consultant, right? Those two were like gasoline in a match. <laughs> they, they were always complaining about each other. They always worked at odds to each other, even though they were tops. It, you know, and they should, you know, should have been able to mesh and come up with a superior result. They were literally killing the, 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 the entire program because they couldn't work together. And so, you know, you have that type of stuff that comes up with the personalities and sometimes you have to make adjustments and, and get rid of really great people because they just won't fit in and work with the others. Now, now you you know you deal with a lot of turnaround situations in 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 your type of uh, yeah. consulting that you do, right? Yeah. And I I I guess is it go down to the point where you actually have to realign the whole organization because you realize that you know the whole leadership structure that had happened had had really caused the situation to be more like, like you're saying, maybe a more, more militaristic organization where it was just paralyzed by its leader. Right. I had one organization that I walked into and within the first six months had to fire an entire clinical development team, <laughs> sue one of them and then get out of a lease, uh, get out of a, a five-year lease on the facilities they had and close it down. We did it in 24 hours. I mean, it was, it became so contentious, uh, that group with the rest of the organization, that that was the only way that you could resolve the problem. Um, and yeah, I, it, it was, it was horrible. Uh, you know, I, w I wish there had been an alternate way to deal with it, but yeah, that stuff happens. And sometimes you just have to clean house. Sometimes you walk in and you realize that the technology that you're trying to develop with the people that you've got, the technology may not get you where you need to go, but the people you've got can't fit with a new technology. So sometimes you have to ask them to go and then re and realign around a new technology. 
So it becomes, you know, there become situations that unfortunately you can't always realign the people you got with the technology or you can't get the people to work together and you have to make adjustments. So it's almost kind of like you're kind of suggesting that at certain points, you know, you could do a lot of these things as a leader and 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 try to correct your behavior to try to improve the situation. But there's, there seems to be a point of no return after a while, right? Well, after a while, it becomes it becomes where the amount of energy and time you're spending is so excessive that you'd be better off cleaning a house and getting rid of it and starting fresh. So it's a time, time value, uh, you know, time and, uh, you know, has a value, money value to it. Uh, you know, if, if you spend, uh, if, if everything is taking you twice as long or three times as long because people won't get together, you're losing money just by sitting there and not moving as rapidly as you can. If you have people working counterproductively to each other and, you know, slowing projects down or other kinds of things, then you, you have to make adjustments in order to fix that. And it's, it's hard. And no matter how, how much you try to help people, sometimes no matter how much you try to help people, you can't bring them to where they need to be. You, you know, the, um, these leadership, uh, kind of what I call, uh, lessons that you put in your blog every month. And this is just another example of one of, you know, actually getting everyone to kind of, um, you know, collaborate more than just dictate. These are life lessons. I, I know when I had my first management assignment, I, I wasn't perfect. I made a lot of mistakes and, and, and sometimes I had to leave that situation to go to another one and kind of reflect back and say, okay, I did this, this, and this, maybe this next time I'll do that, that, and that, you know, that type of thing. Right. Well, I, I made mistakes and, and I was fortunate to have people that would work with me and I was the kind of person that said, well, I recognize I made a mistake. That was really stupid. And have people that work with me uh, about um, different ways to do things so that I wouldn't make that mistake again. And if you have an individual that makes mistakes and you're able to work with them and then help bring them and educate them and bring them along, that's good. Some people won't listen. <laughs> And, uh, you know, or, or, or have in their head, they know what to do and, and they're just not going to listen to you. And that's bad. <laughs> so you really do need to work up where people are willing to work together. Uh, if there's an opportunity that you believe you can improve on things and work with the individual and help them become better, you want to do the, that. Um, use, use the get rid of them as the last resort. But, I mean, sometimes you have to do that. Well, I think you point out in, in not only your book, but in a lot of things that we talk about in agile thinking is really the openness and the way of accepting some of these things to try to improve the situation, right? Well, it it's all comes down to that you can get so locked into um, where you want to go or how you think things are supposed to work that you limit yourself and you limit your options. And the goal is in agile thinking is to not limit your options, but to be able to explore those options and then try to make sure that you adapt in order to be able to pick the best things that are going to get you where you got to go. And it's, it's not always easy. Sometimes you have to make decisions and sometimes it's hard to make those decisions. And maybe those decisions are at odds to where you were trying to get to. But maybe that by making that decision, it takes you to a new place that's better. <laughs> and, and, and that's all part of the evaluative process of thinking agile. Yeah. Yeah. Now I I understand, and really, uh, you know, to go back to kind of what we're talking about today. Um, w one thing as a leader, you you kind of mentioned here is I want to quote you here. You, you know, you need to encourage each team team member to use their ability to seek improved solutions or better products. So, so imagine an environment where the entire staff feels pride and empowered to contribute maximally to achieve the of achievement of the assigned goals, which is, you know, I, I think that was the summary of the whole article that you wrote. I mean, that, that's, that's the end goal that as a leader you want to achieve, right? I mean, can you imagine you, you're working on creating a product and all of a sudden you find out that, okay, with a little bit of extra money or a little bit of extra time or with a slight change in direction, you end up something that instead of going into one market, you go into a market 10 times that? <laughs> or, or your capture of the market instead of being 10%, you know, by making the adjustments, you went into one that's 25%. What's the value of that? And that's what you're trying to achieve is, is that, you know, give them an opportunity to help you capture and sell the best that, products that you can 
so that your <clears throat> your customers are ultimately going to benefit. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, after I read this article, I, I started to reflect on a lot of things where I saw successful teams that I've led and, and not so successful teams that I've led. And, you know, every leader goes through that. It, they go through, you know, they go through situations where the outcome wasn't as optimal. Uh, you know, I'll use one of your words, that I call it that. And you go through situations where you reflect back and say, wow, we did some great things with that team, yeah. you know, so. You know, that's, that's your long-term objective is to try, try to do that. And they're not all going to work out great. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to understand that failure happens. Um, and as long as everybody did the best that they could, if it failed because it should have failed, that's fine. If it failed because you contributed to the failure, that's not good. You want to have everybody work. And if it's supposed to fail because the product was no good, that's okay. I get it. <laughs> you know, sometimes that happens. The technology just wasn't strong enough to be able to get you where you have to go, but it shouldn't fail because of the people component. Makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know, thank you again for your time. And I know, um, you know, you had a kind of a busy week, a busy sure. few weeks at the West Coast there. So we'll close off the interview. And I, again, I, I, I again, reiterate, thank you for your time. So, so uh, how's your book going? And, you know, tell, tell the listeners how you, uh, they can get a hold of your book and uh, learn more about Agile uh, le Leadership in the Agile Thinking book. Or well, you, agile. you can go to the, on the bottom of the screen, it says colonialtdc.com and there are links in there. There's a link to the book, which the book is thinkagilebook.com. It's thinkagilebook.com, but you'll find the link in the Colonial TDC. You'll also find links in both of those to the uh, startup blog and to the examiner articles. Um, I also occasionally put out other articles. Uh, you'll find links to my uh, Twitter, uh, uh, you know, Twitter name, and you'll see that sometimes I put other stuff out to be a Twitter uh, or, or LinkedIn. Uh, you'll have links to that. So, you know, it's, it's not hard to find me. If you just go to the first one, you'll find links to everything. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Well, again, uh, thank you. And um, uh, we'll, we'll talk again next month. We'll find another topic, I'm sure, to, to teach everyone uh, some thinking agile in either leadership or product development or something else that you may want to share with us. So anyway, right. thanks, for, th thanks for joining us, everyone. This is Great Gloria, AK Social Break on Twitter for the Nerd Stalker Media Network, where we believe in tech, startups, design, and you. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and be careful out there. Thanks again, Taffy. Have a thanks, great day. Greg. See you later.